Welcome once again to Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. Today I'll be interviewing Dr. Judith Orloff. She is a psychiatrist, an empath, and also an intuitive healer. She's on the clinical faculty in psychiatry at UCLA, also a New York Times bestselling author, and her latest work is titled Empath Survival Guide, Life Strategies for Sensitive People. Judith, it's so nice to get the opportunity to speak with you. So welcome to, uh, to this uh, Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce uh, show. Oh, it's wonderful to talk to you too, and I love Edgar Cayce. Yes, I understand you've been here uh, several times, and you'll, you'll be here in the, in the future. So we're excited about that. I will be. I'll be here in four weeks, a uh, little over four weeks. Just walk us a little bit through kind of your, your childhood being empathic or being an empath and then having dream, a very strong dream connection. And then I, you eventually went to medical school, became a psychiatrist, and you've weaved all this together into this kind of unique, uh, you know, for now it's a unique branch of, of the healing uh, tradition that you're part of or that you've created. Right. Well, my childhood, I was um, an only child, and both my parents were physicians, and I had 25 physicians in my family. Uh -huh. I had these predictive dreams. Uh -huh. I would dream of earthquakes. I would dream of my parents' friends breaking up. I would dream uh -huh. of a suicide attempt. Uh -huh. You know, those types of things, and I was very little. You know, I was eight, nine, seven, you know, around that. Were you able to talk to your parents about your dreams? Well, I tried, but they, they, they said, how can you say such terrible things about my friends? Oh, so they weren't very supportive. They were more afraid of what was happening? They loved me, you know, but they were afraid um, for, for reasons I write about in my book, Second Sight, you know, which was my first book about my journey to come into my intuitive abilities as a psychiatrist and as a woman. But I have a chapter oh, in that, that on my month. Oh, you have Second Sight! <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Great. Well, I write a chapter in that book on my mother's deathbed and being there for her. And mm -hmm. she revealed to me that she was a psychic and she had all these abilities all her life. And she, but she was a physician in Beverly Hills. She didn't want to tell her peers that because she didn't want to be considered weird. That was her big phobia about not being considered weird. And she projected that on me. Was That's that in she, the, with the fifties or sixties that she was practicing? I mean, it was, probably before the New Age movement had really come out. Well, she was in the emergency rooms in the oh. 40s. Oh, I see. Know, when the men went off to war. And so my mother and her sister, my Aunt Phyllis, were women in emergency rooms, both doctors. So mm -hmm. they were amazingly pioneering women yeah. you know, in that time. And then my mother moved to Beverly Hills, moved us from Philadelphia to Beverly Hills. Um, I think it was in the 60s or 70s, something something around there, but she had a practice for all those years, and she had that idea. She didn't want to be considered weird yeah. all those years, so yeah. she really never gave it up. I see. So you had that model of very strong women, and so that was part of your your confidence in kind of trendsetting. Yeah. Fantastic to have women like that. Yeah. And you know, to have those women. I mean, she had problems and insecurities, and, you know, we had our issues together, but one thing she did instill in me is the power of being a woman in a profession, and that nothing can stop me. Now, did you feel that becoming a psychiatrist was in some way fulfilling kind of a family, kind of, you said 25 doctors, so was it kind of like, before you could go branch out, you thought you should honor your family by becoming a doctor? Oh, no, no, not at all. Not. It's the exact opposite. Because I was brought up around so many doctors, I didn't want to do that. I wasn't interested in science. I was not good in math. Mm -hmm. I was more of a writer and a creative person. And, you know, I was more on the edge and my friends were artists. And so I, I wanted, I didn't know what I, I was floundering around at the time. I didn't mm -hmm. know what I wanted to do. I dropped out of college and I was living with my boyfriend in, in Venice Beach, mm. you know, laundromat. And then, you know, I had a dream that told me to become a psychiatrist to get an MD in order to have the credentials to legitimize intuition and medicine. Uh -huh. It was crystal clear. Yeah. 
just a voice, not yeah. not any intonation really, neutral, mm-hmm. but just an announcement. Mm-hmm. And in the dream, it, it sounded okay, I'll do that. But then I woke up and I thought, what? Because <laughs> I didn't want to go to school all those years. It was my ego didn't want to do it. But because I was beginning to trust my intuition at that point, I enrolled in a community college and took one class. And one became two, became 14 years of medical training because I took that little mini step that's so necessary in the beginning to get energy going. If you have these kind of dreams, um, even if you think they're not going to happen, just a little effort just to see if maybe you're wrong, wrong, Mm. you know. The wind could come behind your back. That's what happens with these dreams. The wind suddenly is behind your back, so you're flying forward in the right direction. Well, how was that? Oh, go ahead. No, that's what happened to me. Well, how was that for you being an empath and then going through the whole medical training? I mean, my, my parents, my mother, father, and two of my sisters are also doctors. And so I know that, yeah, and I, so I know that there's, you know, it's not a, it's not an easy training. There's, there's ways, there's times where you have to kind of almost put up a wall or, or detach in a way. Did you learn how to do that or did you, how how was that for you? Well, I kind of shifted out of intuitive mode into science mode. Uh, uh Like I said, I had the wind behind my back. So it kind of pushed me in the direction I needed to be in at the time. So I strayed very far from my intuition, although it had awakened at a young age. When I got involved with science, I got directed just totally immerse yourself in science. And I saw a lot of psychotic people in the emergency room who claimed to be psychic. And that scared me because these people are psychotic and they need medication. And so in my immersion into medicine, I just kind of let my intuition go except in hospice because I I worked in hospice. Uh And that was very powerful. I would sit with the dying, and I would be on call every third night. You know, my people would go off, and we had beepers, and I think they still have beepers. Anyways, my people would go off, and I'd have to pronounce somebody dead. And so I I had the opportunity to be with the body as it was transitioning, and the soul transitioning from being in this world to the next. So is that when you started to kind of combine, let's say, being a medical doctor and then being a spiritual doctor? Was it in hospice that that started to awaken, the duality? It was always awakened. I just didn't tell anyone. Oh. Because I didn't want to um, be considered weird. My mother had programmed me with this yeah. phobia about being weird. And mm-hmm. I just knew I found kind of a niche for myself for the first time in my life. I love treating patients from day one. I loved it. I was not that great in the sciences, so I got through with the help of angels who were boyfriends, a boyfriend at the time who was an anatomy instructor who got me through. He locked me in the anatomy lab. He turned on Bruce Springsteen. This was in Philadelphia. And he said, you're going to do this. (laughs) And he was irreverent, and he was determined. Yeah. So he, he showed me, you know, how the human body was made because he had access to the corpses. And, you know, so I learned the nervous system and I learned the organs, you know, through his irreverent love, you know, kind of got me over the hump. I, so I, I, somehow yeah. when I hear Bruce Springsteen going forward, I'm going to think of you with cadavers learning anatomy. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> but that's my path. You know, everybody has your path, whoever is listening to this. Yeah. This is because I want to emphasize this for everybody, because I opened up to the possibility that my dream might be right. That guided me in terms of when I met obstacles, such as not being able to learn anatomy, then I was brought this beautiful guy, you know, in terms of a boyfriend who I hear and he could help me. And I was always open to get help. That was a really good thing about me. And I'm very open for help when I can't do it myself. Now, did you wrestle with that same, like your mom had that dilemma with wanting to be taken seriously, and so she suppressed her psychic, or at least talking about it. Did you feel that you eventually came out, that you were able to maintain your legitimate medical practice, but also kind of express yourself with your metaphysical, spiritual side? Well, the answer is yes. (laughs) 
When, <laughs> when did that come out? Like wh where in your career did that book emerge? Well, this book came out in, um, the, the paperback is gonna be um, this year, 2018, and the hardcover was 2017. This isn't my coming out book, but this is an example, the Empath Survival Guide of my comfort with my voice. Yeah. <laughs> out and just sharing where I'm at to help other people yeah <laughs> and second sight was really my process of coming out it took me eight years to write yeah I was filled with fear filled with the programming that I can't be weird because everyone's gonna reject me or make fun of me as a doctor and back then when I wrote second sight in the late 90s nobody was doing that yeah. and I remember publishers said you're not going to get any media on this. Nobody's going to know what to do with this. And, you know, of course it wasn't true, but that was the, what I heard. Did, it, did you suffer in the medical community? Like, was there a, a backlash against you or kind of labeling you as uh, airy-fairy or something like that? I mean, did you, was that a, were you able to transition or, or what was that like when the book came out? Well, I did it kind of slow and steady. I didn't make a big deal out of it. And I had, you know, I was, I was brought up in, in, in the medical profession and I, you know, had friends at UCLA in my residency program. I was on staff there. You know, I, I'd gone through USC medical school and these were my friends. So you had, you were, your, your credibility was unquestionable. Yeah. yeah. And I had no desire to go against them. Yeah. It was never my impulse. It was always just to add something that might be helpful, you know, to their, to the medical profession, and I've spoken at the um, psychiatric association meetings on intuition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't use the word psychic. Yeah, I was there because they can't take that; it's just too much for them. <laughs> and do you still are you still practicing psychiatry? As, and then you you have this new age kind of branch to your to your perfect to your career. So they they to you they exist side by side. Well, I think the key is that they liked me. Mm -hmm. And that got over some of the resistance because I'm so nice and they yeah. like me so much and, I, and they know that I'm a good doctor. Yeah. So I think that's what helped. You know, of course there are people who say, oh, this is so new age, I don't want anything to do with that. You know, or, or the surgeons, the good old boys club, you know, yeah. like my hammer and knock, you know, hammer, yeah. hammer, hammer. And the thing is, I have such respect for everybody. I think it kind of tones down any kind of resistance. And if they have resistance, God bless them. They, they can do whatever they like. I've yeah. never said it is my role to, you know, transform anyone who doesn't want to be open to this. This is about attraction. And there's so many doctors and healthcare professionals and every healer, healers and patients who are just drawn to this. I mean, there's a huge wave of people around the world who are drawn to this. So that's enough for me. The ones that don't want to do it, God bless them, find your truth in another way. Mm -hmm. So it's been my attitude all along. I don't have any resentment. Mm -hmm. you know, though, though I'm wary personally of going to conventional doctors unless I really know them mm -hmm. because I know because of their lack of awareness of energy fields in the body as an empath, they're not going to really understand me. Mm -hmm. They're going to, if I need medication, they're going to give me too much of it. Yeah. You know, or right. if I need some kind of a treatment, they're not going to understand how this is going to pummel my system. Mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, how it's hard to go into an MRI because it's just, you know, impasse sometimes are claustrophobic. Yeah. They don't, they don't know that. They just like, get in there, do it. So it, it's a, a brutal system for empaths. That's why I wrote the Empath Survival Guide and that's what our workshop will be about. What are what um, are some just, um, what are a handful of these uh, tools or kind of what do you wish you had known maybe along the way that you, you teach? What do I wish I, I had known along the way? Well, you, that you learned, but you learned the hard way, like without having, you didn't, you didn't have your book to read. So, so you kind of learned, I imagine, just from being put into situations that were, were challenging for you that you later, you said, well, I, I want to help people so they, they don't have to confront these things or learn how to protect themselves or establish, I don't know, boundaries. Or just what, what would be a handful of, of, or a couple of tools that come to your mind that, that um, are helpful to empaths? Well, the, the number one thing that I learned, and I knew immediately, 
was that my patients needed to trust their intuition that it wasn't just about an intellectual understanding of whatever it is they were going through. Ah. And the healing was mind, body, and soul. It was never not that. Ah. So you, would, you help your clients, as part of their healing process, kind of listening to what their intuition is telling them. Like, does this sound right? Or what are your dreams telling you and helping them to interpret them so that they can kind of get a clue about uh, their own path? Oh, that's they wonderful. Themselves. They have to leave therapy. I'll, I'll be there as a guide when I'm there, but I'm not going to be around forever. And it's not good for them to keep coming in all the time. You know? Right. So they don't. You don't create dependency. Nah, I yeah. don't. I'm, I'm, I'm too busy because I travel around giving workshops, and the patients that come to me in my private practice, you know, I tell them I'm not here for you every week. You can't call me for emergencies. I'm not that type of of. of help for you but i can't guide you and so i often work with other therapists who are the mainstay of the person and then they come to me for guidance if they want to develop their intuition if they want to learn about what being an empath is and to learn how to set boundaries no is a complete sentence mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great and it, you know how hard it is for people to say no oh yeah Yes, especially empaths who are so giving and they want to help you and they want you to feel better and they want to do for you and it's too much. So they have to learn to reel it back a little bit, you know, and hold space for people rather than try and fix people. Yeah. It's a whole different. So do you system. find that people, that what blocks people's trusting of their intuition is kind of these um, societal constructs that they have about who they should be or who their parents taught them to be or what a woman is supposed to be or what a man is supposed to be so they get lost behind this armor and they don't really tune into who they actually are. Right, it's just educational. They're not trained to do it yeah. and then sometimes depending on the religion they were brought up in that could traumatize them and give them misguided notions yeah. about what intuition is. So you know, I have one patient who's very spiritual and I've known him for a long time but he refuses to pray because he was brought up you know, on the ground. He, we, sometimes I get on the ground with people because I love going on the ground. I, just on my thing. I love uh -huh. it. A meal. Uh -huh. <laughs> my altar is my thing. But yeah. he won't do it at all. So uh -huh. I would never do it. As he was traumatized by that. So we sit in my office and he's upright. Praying. He could pray, but he just doesn't want to supplicate himself. Yeah. No, fine. I, I see. So, so you teach your clients how to pray, how to meditate, how to interpret their dreams, how to to listen to their feelings as they react to what you're saying to them, how, what, how they react to what other people say to them. Oh, that's wonderful. What a great uh, resource. Yeah. Yeah. It's so I love it all. I've been given this career, if you call it a career, a mission, whatever it is, where everything I'm doing and all the different aspects of it, my workshops, my patient work, um, my books, um, everything, it's just so good. Well, you're you know, very much in line, you know, Casey's work was really about self-empowerment. You know, even like when people got readings from him, he wasn't like Jesus healing them. They had to do stuff right. to, to heal themselves. And they had to ask themselves a lot of questions and they had to engage their spiritual self, their mental self and their physical self in this healing process. So, so I'm glad that you're bringing, that's very much the legacy of Edgar Casey. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very connected to Casey. Yeah in many ways, but in that way as well. But also, you know, what I feel strongly about is, is seeing the soul in somebody. Mm -hmm. When I'm working with somebody, it's not just listening to their symptoms and putting them in a little box. Not that. Although I, I, I do use the psychiatric framework. I do have that going too, but I kind of bring them all together and I see what resonates and I take the good from them all. So I'm not against anything. But what intuition allows me to do as a psychotherapist is to know which option is best for somebody. Mm -hmm. to feel the resonance. It doesn't fall flat. It doesn't feel like I'm pushing something on someone. It feels like, hmm, what would be the best for them? I'll tune in and I can feel certain things. Then I'll say, well, how do you, what feels the best to you? And then it's usually the same thing. Yeah. So, and if it's not, we'll talk about it. So it's actively engaging patients, especially empath, intuitive patients, and Working that muscle, because a lot of times they don't work it. They don't know how to work it, and yeah. that's one thing I do all the time. I work it because it's part of my lifestyle, and, and it's a devotion yeah. to me. It's just something I do. It's a 
lifelong devotion. Do you have a, like a daily practice or is it more spontaneous? Well, I have a daily meditation practice. Uh -huh. I have altar, I have flowers and Kuan Yin, and on the new moon and the full moon, I do certain rituals and prayers, uh -huh. and I'm deep on those days. Uh -huh. And I follow the cycles of nature, um, and I'm very connected to what's going on in the natural world. Mm -hmm. uh, through my meditation practice, and I teach empaths to do this, the heart meditation, where you close your eyes, you go inward, take a few breaths to breathe out the everyday life, and then just feel your heart energy. And you could focus on something you love, but cultivating the heart energy, which cultivates every day a little bit more over a lifetime, and it fills your body. You can go into a room, and you, you're able to transform mm. things, heart mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. And most students don't have a clue how to do that. Uh -huh. I mean, this should be a freshman year. Yeah. As I'm concerned, how to connect mm -hmm. heart and channel that energy. But it's as an empath, learning to work with energy. This is what healthcare professionals, most of them, don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. And it's key is learning how to work with your energy. If I'm sitting with you, I'm tuning into your energy. I can feel you. And so it's a dance. I'm not just talking to you with my head. I'm feeling you, and it doesn't matter that you're at a distance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. But it's using you for the benefit of you. I mean, not that you know, I'm using you as an example. Right. But, you know, that's what's so beautiful about my work, and in terms of being satisfying, oh my God, because I long for connection. You know, that's one of the most important things in my life, is the connection with people, mm -hmm. with, me, with the moments, you know, and I, I really don't like to be too busy. Because mm -hmm. that helps me. And when I'm numb, I can't connect as well. What's your secret? How, how do you stay not so busy? Time management. Yeah. Say no. So you no know, um, is a complete sentence. <laughs> no is a complete sentence. Um, I've gotten myself in trouble in the past by over committing and doing too much, and I get miserable. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not happy when I do that. I could be helpful to other people. You know, I could go out and do give a lot of workshops and be helpful to them, but I walk, I'm home. I have to recuperate myself. Yeah. Yeah. I have to reconnect. It's too much for my yeah. sensitive system. So I do just, I try to do just enough. Yeah, so, so you found the balance for yourself. It's a process. Yeah. Now, have you, um, my, my role with ARE is I do a lot of uh, hypnosis and regression work. Have you have been, have dreams shown you kind of past lives where you've been involved with this kind of work that you, this is just a continuation of a many life pattern of trying to awaken people to their soul selves? Um, I don't know. I have one past life where I'm sure I would have had a political voice mm. where I was, you know, very vocal in a village, you know, um, like in, you know, in, in around the time of Art of King Arthur and those forests, the way yeah. they were. And I was suppressed, you know, like many yeah. healers, suppressed, yeah. um, chased into the forest, killed, tortured, my family was killed in front of me. Uh, and, I, you know, that kind of thing that many right. healers go through. Yeah. But yeah. That, that particular past life, you know, I had to work with so it doesn't stifle my voice now. Yeah. So it seems like you've done a good job of kind of healing, <laughs> healing that, realizing it's a different age yeah. that you can, it's a time where it's a little bit safer to, uh, to express your, uh, your views. Now, now, how do you feel about, um, you know, that Edgar Cayce talked about this time we're living in. You could say from 1958 to 2038, it's a 80-year kind of important uh, cycle for, for the Earth or for consciousness. How have you felt about, you know, what's going on in, let's say, the last 20 years as far as empaths? I mean, I'm asking it from a place where, you know, social media is, is really booming and, and it seems that people take their masks off on social media and they can be either... Uh, very critical or it can, it can become very, you know, social media can be wonderful, but it can also be a place where people are bullies and kind of people are uh, abusive. Well, I have a, an empath support community on Facebook with over 10,000 empaths. Ah. So they could go there and talk about... So it's a safe place for empaths on social media. Oh, that's place. great. And when it isn't a safe place, I just remove the comments. Yeah. You know, I have to monitor it very closely because uh -huh. people can 
you know, and I don't talk about anything political or allow anything political on that site. It's just too highly polarizing. Yeah, Can't do it. it really you know, is. And how overwhelmed everyone is. I totally get it. But getting in discussions like that, what I've seen on Facebook is that it, they degenerate every time in yeah. the yelling and polarizing. And we're not at a point where we can discuss those things. Yeah. So I don't think that's my experience. So is your is your recommendation for people just okay. to be to be more protective that that it's almost like um, we're, we're in some ways we're more connected than ever before, but that can also be negative. It's not just positive, and for people to be cautious about where they where they make themselves vulnerable. Actually, <laughs> yeah, because people just reveal too much information, you know, and you know, long stories about their narcissist this, and then their brain tumor, and then their loss of her dog, and all in one paragraph, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so much. No, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have to have very clear guidelines for this group where we talk about, you know, one topic at a time, make the post short, uh, make it empath solution oriented. So I really, you know, people have gotten mad at me for that. I say, you're overly controlling this group. And I'm like, too bad, go to another group, basically. You know, yeah. I, it doesn't yeah. work any other way. Right. So, you know, I've had to set limits in terms of, you know, just stay on point. Yeah. Because on Facebook, you, people get so off point, and it's just not what I wanted to create, you know, and I wanted to create a safe bubble for people, and if you don't like it, there are many other groups you can go to. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. I mean, you do that, I imagine that's for free, that you just provide your time and access. Well, it's all free, you yeah. know, it's all, yeah, I, I'm very involved with this group for the past few years, and they, people come to my workshops, and I meet them sometimes, and it's very gratifying because you can reach a lot of people. You know, as an empath, I love staying at home in my pajamas in bed, you know, going on my group, you know. It's much better than having to slip through airports and, you know. Yeah. Well, as an empath, I like being at home. Well, you've really, you know, the, Casey gave a reading where he talked about social change and he said, first it's with individuals and then we can work with groups and then we start teaching classes and then it reaches the masses. And it seems like you've really taken that that step. Do you still work with some people individually? I do. So you're at each level. You're doing individual group classes and masses. And you have yeah. and you feel balanced. That, that's a, that's a great. I, yeah, I, I feel like getting on the floor now to kind of. No, because I, I find that in, even in my little bubble of a world, I feel that I get so over committed. You know, it's so hard to you know, I guess you said how it's so hard to turn things down. And for me, it's just about um, you know, security. I, I feel insecure when I say no, and I feel more secure when I say yes. Right. Even like, do you tune in to your intuition whether you get a yes or no? You know, it's hard to tell because I think sometimes there's, um, you know, this male family work ethic. Like I, I work for myself, and so my income is dependent. I don't get when I used to have a I'd be an employee. I felt much more kind of comfortable with managing my time but since I do my own my own you know I work for myself I, I'm always worried about when is it going to dry up like I better you know I, I feel like the squirrel that's constantly putting the, the acorns you know like when's enough acorns you know it's like what is the what's the winter going to be like so you're right I, I don't think I do tune in enough and ask my guides or angels or dream about it to kind of say Peter you're going to be Okay, you know, like when I do tune in, I kind of feel like this life is not one where I have to worry about resources. My whole life has been pretty uh, plentiful as far as resources go. Right. Well, you know, my I just had a workshop with my spiritual teacher who was a Taoist mm -hmm. for the last two weeks. And, and he said, when you have something like fear, you know, yelling at you or knocking at your door, you just say to it, stop bothering me. <laughs> <laughs> that appeals to you. Just go away. Stop bothering me. And I have yeah. to stay, you know, focused. Yeah. You have to work with those energies of fear and security. Yeah. We all have them. I however, they manifest. I remember being in a dream study group, and a member had this recurrent dream of being chased by a tiger. And as we processed it, you know, eventually she, she confronted the tiger, and the tiger said, "If you drop this pen." You know, it was like it's been, been it was about her fear of writing and expressing herself. You know, so it's sometimes these fears that we have. They're, you know, they're, they're paradoxical. In, in what 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 are we really running away from? Sometimes Absolutely. it's our own selves. 
Yeah, that's so true. And, um, you know, in my books, I really encourage people to deal with the healing power of nightmares. No, I had a nightmare last night, you know, about a, a choice I'm going to make and my insecurities about a choice yeah. of speaking in a venue that's chaotic. I, I don't like speaking in chaotic venues, but by nature of what this particular one is, it's chaotic with thousands of people. Ah. So I, you know, that's not my yeah. happy place. I see. So you have a dilemma because you want to speak on the subject and reach the people, but it's uh, it's going to be energetically overwhelming or challenging for you. Yes, uh, very. Difficult. And what was the dream? What was the? How did the dream? Did it did it help you? Did it point you say maybe you should say no or or accept it? Did it did it give you that a clear direction to take? Well, it just brought to brought forth my anxieties about the environment. Uh, like I, my assistant wasn't getting me the right microphone, so I uh, didn't have the microphone uh, to speak. I and see. then I was asked to be in a small group in addition to this large group, and I didn't have enough time to be in both, and uh, so it was overwhelming. Thing. Yeah. And so it was just alerting me to what I commit to needs to be simple. Uh, if I do this at all, because yeah. I have patients about it. Yeah. You know, it's just too chaotic, you know, but it's, you know, it's always a choice. It's yeah. like, here's how I'm feeling, but yet there's some really good points about it. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know, it's weighing and balancing. Well, it's so great to, you know, to speak with you. And, you know, and, and then I imagine if I had you as a teacher, because um, you're, you're a living you're living through what you're teaching, you know, as a highly empathic person, you're, you're having to deal with all the things that we all deal with. And so you're putting into practice and you know the challenges of it. And so I, I think of that those are the best teachers, the ones that are actively practicing what they're, what they're teaching. So I think we'll, right. we'll, we'll be lucky to have you. Oh, I, I'm so lucky to have ARE, you know, yeah. it's a mutual love fest. Yeah. And I think the ARE is like a safe place for empaths. That I think that a lot of our staff and a, and a lot of the people that come here, it's a it, it it's almost like a safe harbor. Other places in their life, they have to be more protected. And here, they feel a little bit like they can talk about their guides, their angels, their intuition. They, it's more uh, a safe place. And so I think having you specifically, who who teaches them how to make larger parts of their world safer places. Absolutely. And I, I hope what's happening in a lot of places where I'm speaking is after I leave, they form empath support groups on their own, you know, like a study guide of the book. Mm -hmm. And it's working out really well. Now, how do you how do you feel about that word? Does it um, I mean, as I hear the word empath, do you feel that it has is it a neutral word? Is it is it someplace? Is it stigmatized? Is it is it seen? You know, is, is, is empath been used historically negatively? to say, oh, you're too sensitive. You know, I can think of a lot of people well, get labeled that way. Always put down, you're overly sensitive. Mm -hmm. My parents used to say, just get a thicker skin. Right. You need thicker skin, honey. And I'm, you know, eight years old, thicker skin. How do I process that? <laughs> well, well, I always tell people that I think that sensitivity is healthy. You know, numbness is not healthy. You know, the opposite of sensitivity is becoming numb. And I think our world in some ways teaches people to be numb, but that's not the, that's not the state, the healthy state of the soul is to, that, that being sensitive, like how to, how you manage that. But it's like you're saying, it's, it's learning how to be sensitive in a world that, that sometimes you have to protect yourself. You can't be just completely open all the time. Yeah. And the message of the empath survival guide is how to be sensitive and at the same time, not absorb the stress and toxicity of the world. It's those are the skills I apply in my life. It's not just, I'm so sensitive yeah. and all, everything's blasting me. No, yeah. I wanted to offer, how do you stay open but not take on somebody wow. but they anger, they're dumping it. Or do you find that that's the hardest part? Like that's like the PhD level of the work? Learning no. how to, learning how to, that's the beginning level. Oh yeah, that's yeah. the first thing I teach my patients. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, even if it's just breathing out stress because people tend to hold their breath when they're afraid or stressed and that keeps toxic energy in you know the body yeah. and so just release it just visualize whatever you did if you took in from this person just release it and let the breath carry it out you see the breath is very mobile yeah. and it loves to circulate things and carry it out so just simple techniques like follow yeah. your breath 
take a few breaths, meditate for three minutes so you can center yourself. Um, learn to set boundaries. Don't hug somebody that you don't like their energy. Get in a bath to you know, really cleanse the negative energy because water is so healing. So those are pretty easy to do steps to begin to incorporate them into one's life. That's a start. Yeah. That's the beginners. But there are all, you know, levels of, of working with energy. Yeah. Yeah. Casey yeah. said that like being in water kind of changes your charge and then it makes your, your charge positive, which just makes you more at peace. So it's kind of supporting what you're teaching. That's so true. I love water. I'm really a water person. I get in my bath every night and just go into trance. I just, yeah. you know, let myself float and go into trance. I just love my baths. And you know, one thing I became aware of, I have two elderly friends now. One is 90 and the other is 80. And they don't have the, the strength to get in and out of their bath anymore. You know, so they can't take their baths. Even with the, the support, yeah. they don't have the arm strength to uh. do it. The idea of my bath being might not be forever. Who knows? Yeah, it's horrifying to me. That's I've never. True. I know. So there's a whole fee, There's a whole market for developing for people when they lose their arm strength. How they could still take baths. Yeah, I don't know how that would be unless they have help. Getting Maybe they in have a seatbelt. You wear a seatbelt or something. It keeps you upright. I don't know how they get out. I mean, they, yeah. she can sit bath but she can't get herself needs, out yeah you need help yeah yeah but if there was some way like an elevator to get you up yeah you know some like kind that's of what they do at hospitals with with pools they have those yeah. lifts yeah right some lift to get them out of the bathtub it would be so great because the losing both of these women love their baths they yeah. cleanse the negative energy in the bathtub and neither of them really told me about that this was happening that they lost the ability to take a bath um, but then I sort of got it out of them somehow. I don't yeah. know how. Uh, Shocking to me that, you know, we have to be really grateful for the things we might take for granted. Yeah. Yeah, so if there's a whole, uh, these are all resources that are available that you help people understand because you can think of a bath as just a luxury as opposed to thinking of it as something that's really emotionally and physically and spiritually supportive of being in the earth. You know, that water of life, whatever you want to call it water of life, the sacred waters that you immerse yourself in, yeah. feel what that is. Yeah. And is that new agey? I don't think so. I think it's primal. I think it comes from, you know, in Greece, you know, with, you know, Hippocrates and the healing traditions. And yeah. if you're, you go to the temple and you share a dream and you immerse yourself in the waters as oh, part yeah. of, yeah, the discovery process, that, that appeals to me. Well, the, the baptism, you know, that, that is part of Christianity, you know, the, the, the Essenes, they had bathing rituals. You know, the, if you go to Qumran, you see every room had a, like a bathing area. So they really incorporated baths in their spiritual practice. But let me, time is running out, but I wanted, as we're talking, um, I'm thinking, do you associate, is there anything related to astrology and a person's empath? I mean, because in, you know, in a, snapshot of astrology, they would say that maybe water signs tend to be more uh, emotionally available than, let's say, an air sign. Like, I'm, a, I'm an Aquarian, and my childhood was such that we moved around so much that I think I needed that ability to kind of separate myself, or, or it might have been too hard. Right. For, to, to, I think that's true. I think yeah. that's true. I'm a, I'm a moon child, a cancer, uh, so a lot of water in my... I see. Skin. I see. So that's, that's the sign of sensitivity. Of receptivity, yeah. Let's look at water. Look at the way it moves. Yeah. My whole life is water. I mean, I see things as currents, anyways. Even when there's no, yeah, we know it around. But water is my way. But do the other astrological signs have some water in them? Maybe you know that allow them to be more sensitive. Um, I think it just depends on the mix of yeah, all. Yeah. Right. Because I have a grand trine in water. So it gives me a certain, certainly that sensitivity. But that was interesting to think of also the, the role of astrology in kind of your, it's part of your self-defense or kind of your, uh, you know, how you're, you know, how challenging or, or how simple things might be for you as you work through this. Absolutely. I've, I've always looked up at the stars. You know, I've always, you know, when I was little, I used to hope that some spaceship would come and take me to another planet. I didn't feel like I belonged in this one. 
well, I'm quite happy here now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, it looks like you found your, you found your, your bliss. And I understand you, you live near the water. Yeah, so that's, I do. I'm that's wonderful. Now and two blocks from the ocean. So I have two varieties oh, of water. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> now, time has really um, gone quickly. Is there anything, um, any other thoughts you'd like to share with our viewers or anything at all? Anything we haven't covered? Any well, more shout outs to Edgar Casey? Edgar Casey, it's just, it's such a um, profound opportunity to be involved with you. And, you know, the depth of intuition that you can explore in dreams as a community is something to treasure and go deeper with always. Yes. And all the empaths in your community to begin to own your gifts and deal with the challenges and definitely come to my workshop next yeah. month. Yeah. Um, and, and um, you know, if you want, you can get this book, The Empath Survival Guide. And that book, <laughs> Hi, I can say hello. Or the books are waving at each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just keep following your path and, and know that the soul continues beyond this body, which is something you all know, but to really get that. So there's, you don't have to deal with too much terror and fear about passing on. You know, we'll all go. You know, for me, I just want to do as much of this as possible before I go. You know, I just want to, okay. I pray and the stamina to continue on through my later years yeah. to continue to do this. Because when people say, oh, I'm retiring, the, the whole concept of, yeah. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think my path actually works that way. Yeah. That there's yeah. something to retire from. It's just something that I'm a mission that I, I want to continue and I pray to have the ability to do that. Yeah. Well, well, well bless you. I, I've enjoyed our conversation and I feel a sense of, uh, that what a, what a blessing that you're doing the work that you're doing. You know, as much as we're seeing so many challenges, it's nice to know that people like you are doing you know, very uh, healing spiritual work to help people have the resources to deal with the challenges of life. So thank you, thanks for what you do. You're welcome. I hope to meet you in, uh, in the near future, either here or, or at Hay House or wherever we might run into each other. <laughs>